name is Jane Hill and Hello, my name is Jane Hill and I am a hazardous waste inspector for the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. Today I'm going to discuss the regulation standards regarding universal waste management, specifically the regulations at 40 CFR part 273. This table of contents outlines the topics that I will be discussing today in depth. They include the differences between small quantity handlers and large quantity handler regulations, applicable definitions and examples, universal waste management requirements, and finally, ADEQ policies and expectations. To start us off, we will be doing a universal waste overview. There are a few important definitions to pay attention to regarding this topic, and they are generators versus universal waste handlers and universal waste. Universal waste are very specific hazardous waste that the facility can elect to manage under the universal waste requirements under 40 CFR part 273. A universal waste handler is a generator, owner, or operator of a facility that receives universal waste from other universal waste handlers accumulates universal waste and or sends universal waste to another universal waste handler to a destination facility or foreign destination. So you can be a generator of hazardous waste and because you generate, let's say, waste lithium ion batteries and you elect to manage this hazardous waste as a universal waste, you then also become a universal waste handler. There are only five specific hazardous wastes that can be managed under the universal waste requirements, and they are waste batteries, waste lamps, waste mercury containing equipment, waste aerosol cans, and waste pesticides. Lead acid batteries can be managed as universal waste under part 273, but can also be managed under part 266 if they are being reclaimed. If managing under 266, which we do see the most often, there is a nice little table to reference to facilitate you on the management standards. If electing to manage these waste streams is universal waste or 266, then they are not counted towards your monthly hazardous waste generation and therefore do not impact your generator category. Now that we understand what waste streams can be managed as universal waste, it is important to understand the quantity of universal waste accumulated on site. Because like how there are different generator categories depending on how much hazardous waste is generated on site, there are also two different universal waste handler categories based on the amount accumulated on site. So if a facility is accumulating more than 5,000 kilograms, which is approximately 11,000 pounds, the facility would be classified as a large quantity handler of universal waste. If so, the facility would need to obtain an EPA ID number if they don't already have one, register in MyDEQ, and keep basic shipping papers for three years. Additionally, for both small and large quantity handlers of universal waste, they must provide trainings to their employees and can only store universal waste on site for one calendar year. The purpose of these universal waste management standards are to ultimately reduce the amount of hazardous waste items in the municipal solid waste streams, encourage recycling and proper disposal, and to reduce the regulatory burden on facilities managing these types of waste. As mentioned earlier, if a facility is electing to manage those five different waste streams as a universal waste, they are not counted towards monthly hazardous waste generation. Now that we just covered briefly on the types of waste that can be managed as universal waste and the quantities that make facilities a small quantity handler versus a large quantity handler, I will now be going into further detail on the five types of universal waste, the first being universal waste batteries. Battery means a device consisting of one or more electrically connected electrochemical cells, which is designed to receive, store, and deliver electric energy. 
An electrochemical cell is a system consisting of an anode, cathode, and an electrolyte, plus such connections, both electrical and mechanical, as may be needed to allow the cell to deliver or receive electrical energy. The term battery also in includes an intact, unbroken battery from which the electrolyte has been removed. Generation of waste batteries include a used battery becomes a waste on the date that it is discarded, for example, when it is sent for reclamation, or an unused battery becomes a waste on the date the handler decides to discard it. Waste batteries that are in good condition can be managed under the universal waste regulations. However, if the battery is damaged or leaking, the facility must make an accurate hazardous waste determination by analyzing the contents for RICRA hazardous waste characteristics such as D001, ignitability, D002, corrosivity, D003, reactivity, or D004 to D043, toxicity characteristic leaching procedure, or T TCLP for metals or volatile organic compounds, which are also known as VOCs. Some waste batteries can be difficult to distinguish. Your facility may accumulate single-use lithium batteries, rechargeable lithium-ion batteries, and or nickel-cadmium batteries like your AA or AAA batteries. We highly recommend to not remove a lithium battery that is not intended to be replaced because it may be glued into the product or in a container or bag and the removal could result in an immediate fire or explosion. A handler of universal waste may only manage broken or damaged hazardous waste batteries as universal waste if the breakage or damage does not constitute a breach in the cell casing. So it is important to identify when a battery becomes a waste. If a battery is damaged and leaking fluid, it is imperative to make an accurate hazardous waste determination on the battery and subsequent fluid. If the damaged batteries and fluids are determined to be a hazardous waste, they must be managed as such. SQHs and LQHs, SQHs and LQHs can conduct the following activities, mixing batteries, sorting by type, which is highly recommended, especially with those lithium ion batteries, discharge batteries, regenerate use batteries, disassemble, remove batteries from consumer products, and remove electrolytes from batteries. If the handler is removing electrolytes or generating solid waste as a result of the handling activities, the facility must determine if the waste exhibits hazardous characteristics and if so, it must be managed accordingly. If removing batteries, it is important to take precautions to avoid damaging the battery cell. Some best management practices for batteries include making sure batteries are individually packed or have tape terminals to avoid short circuiting. Tape the terminals of each battery with clear tape to see the label and terminal or store them in individual plastic bags to avoid fires if damaged or if the terminal ends touch. Non-clear bags or tapes such as duct tape or electrical tape do not allow a visible identification of the chemistry of the battery when being sorted for recycling and can be a safety hazard to workers. As best management practices, we highly recommend to store batteries in temperature controlled areas and do not stack large batteries more than too high to avoid thermal activations or damage. Furthering best management practices, we highly recommend to sort batteries based on chemistry and to not store batteries in metal or otherwise conductive containers. Some other key points to consider are that it's important to minimize the potential for batteries to be dropped, crushed, or punctured, have contingency plans for handling damaged batteries and for fire responses, which may vary based on type of battery being stored or processed, 
This could include isolating damaged batteries, methods for detecting battery damage, testing and calibrating fire response equipment, and et cetera. And lastly, have an up-to-date, properly coded and designed fire protection system that is very, that is appropriate for your facilities, operations, and batteries. Contact your local fire department and building review agency, whether that's based off of your city or county, to ensure your system is sufficient. The ultimate concern with lithium ion batteries is thermal runaway. Thermal runaway generally starts when a cell is damaged, causing it to short circuit. It heats up and eventually bursts, releasing flammable electrolytes and gases. Then other nearby cells follow the same process, ignite, and eventually the gases explode. A dark vapor cloud forms, which is not smoke, but essentially the gases escaping from the battery cells. There will also be popping noises, which is the cells bursting, which can sound like gunshots. Can also be whizzing and hissing noises from the gases escaping under pressure. And when gases ignite, we'll likely see flames. The next slide, I have a video I want to play that further explains thermal runaway. What is thermal runaway? In lithium ion cells, the movement of lithium ions and electrons produces electricity. The process of a charge and discharge is normally accompanied by a small amount of heat which dissipates from the cell. Thermal runaway is a phenomenon in which the lithium ion cell enters an uncontrollable self-heating state. In thermal runaway, the lithium ion cell generates heat at a rate several times higher than the rate at which heat dissipates from the cell. When the temperature rises at a rate greater than 20 degrees centigrade per minute, the cell has reached thermal runaway. Thermal runaway can result in extremely high temperatures, violent cell venting, smoke, and fire. What is thermal? Some general causes for lithium battery damage include mechanical damage, overcharging or charge at low temperatures, and exposure to heat causing the battery to collapse. The photos you see here are from thermal runaways that occurred at two separate facilities. The two photos on the left are from thermal runaways of electric semi-truck battery packs. The fire department responded by essentially letting the fire burn then eventually added sand, but it took many days for the vehicle and components to be at a safe temperature. The photo on the far right is from improperly packaged lithium ion batteries where a thermal runaway occurred when employees were beginning to process and sort the batteries. Everyone evacuated the facility and no one was injured, but employees explained that the batteries shot off like missiles. Both facilities were required to make an accurate hazardous waste determination on the sand, water, and any debris that was impacted by the fire. If these batteries were stored and packaged appropriately, this likely would not have occurred. We've covered universal waste batteries, so what is mercury-containing equipment? Mercury containing equipments is a device or part of a device such as thermometers that contain elemental mercury. These items are considered a waste when the facility decides to discard it and then it can be managed as a universal waste. Universal waste handlers may also remove mercury containing ampules from mercury containing equipment, provided the handler removes and manages the ampules in regards to proper waste mercury handling and emergency procedures. That summarizes mercury containing equipment. So what are universal waste lamps? Examples of lamps that can be managed as universal waste are fluorescent lamps, HID lamps, neon mercury vapor, and metal halide lamps. We recommend that if you do not test your low mercury lamps, such as the green tip lamps, and prove them as non-hazardous to assume they are hazardous waste for mercury 
and manage them as a universal waste so that they can be safely managed and recycled. We see a lot of instances where facilities hire a third party company to manage and dispose of their mercury containing lamps. The contractor that actually removes the universal waste lamps from service is considered a handler and generator of the waste, making the facility and the contractor co-generators. EPA and ADQ recommends that when two or more parties meet the definition of generator of universal waste, that they should mutually agree to have one party perform the generator duties, which generally becomes the third party company that was hired. It would be wise to check if the contracted company has basic universal waste training. Secondly, if this makes the generator a large quantity handler of universal waste who accumulates over 11,000 pounds, that they are meeting the large quantity handler requirements, which include obtaining an EPA ID number, registering on MyDEQ, and maintaining the documentation on the basic shipping papers. It's possible that when handling lamps at a facility, that they can break. We also see broken lamps when they are not in a container that is structurally sound or is not compatible with this type of waste, such as steel drums. A lamp is considered a hazardous waste if it exhibits the characteristic of hazardous waste toxicity. When a lamp breaks, it releases mercury vapor into the air or onto the phosphor coating on the glass. Specific management standards for mercury containing equipment include preventing releases to the environment. It is important to make an accurate waste determination on broken mercury containing lamps. We, as well as the destination facility, do see that most generators who have broken lamps at their facility manage them as hazardous waste. In the instance these waste streams are managed as hazardous waste, it is then counted towards your monthly generation amount of hazardous waste, not universal waste. What are universal waste pesticides? Pesticides are any substance intended of preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating pests or as a plant regulator. Most of the time, pesticides do not become a waste because facilities can find a use for them. However, they do become a waste when a generator does not want to use it for its intended purpose, so decides to discard it. Or the pesticide is recalled and the handler decides to participate in that recall and discard the pesticide. If you do have a pesticide that you do not want to use, as its intended purpose and then decide to discard it, the generator must make an accurate hazardous waste determination because many pesticides are P and U listed hazardous waste and therefore cannot be managed as universal waste. If you have questions about unused pesticides, you will need to reach out to FIFRA. And for the fifth type of universal waste, aerosol cans. An aerosol can is a non-refillable container that holds a gas under pressure to expel liquid, paste, or powder. These can be found at a variety of facilities. The hazard associated with aerosol cans is the flammable propellant, which can demonstrate the hazardous characteristic for ignitability. Additional to ignitability, this may contain listed hazardous waste, such as some brake cleaner that contains PCE, known as D039. As of 2022, generators in Arizona can elect to manage their waste aerosol cans as universal waste. The can must remain intact, protected from sources of heat, and it is recommended that the actuator is removed to reduce risk of accidental release inside the container in which they are stored in. We still do see some generators choosing to not manage their aerosol cans as universal waste rather than a hazardous waste. The reason we hear the most is that a facility doesn't generate many aerosol cans. And since they are only allowed to store universal waste for one year, 
they would have to ship off a container with two to five cans inside. So generators can manage a fully intact cans as hazardous waste, which allows them to take however long to fill a 55 gallon container. Otherwise, generators can puncture and drain their waste aerosol cans. If you decide to puncture and drain your waste aerosol cans, at that point of puncturing, you lose the universal waste exemption. And there are very specific requirements that must be met when puncturing and draining waste aerosol cans. First, the generator must recycle the empty can. The generator must use a device specifically designed to safely puncture aerosol cans and effectively contain the residual contents, including emissions. A waste determination must be made on the contents, which generally becomes a hazardous waste satellite accumulation area, as shown in the slide above. The generator must establish a written procedure on how to properly puncture and recycle the waste aerosol can. Employees must be trained on how to use the device. There must be a spill cleanup kit in the area and a written procedure on how to properly address the spill. Now that we cover the five types of waste streams that can be managed as universal waste, Next, I will be discussing the universal waste management requirements. All universal waste must be managed in a structurally sound container that is compatible with the contents. The container must prevent releases to the environment and contain any leakage. As seen in the photo in the middle, you can get creative with what the container looks like. All containers, with the exception of aerosol cans, must be closed and universal waste batteries and aerosol cans must be protected from sources of heat. So be mindful of storage locations, particularly in regards to those waste aerosol cans and lithium ion batteries. There are three different ways to label the containers of universal waste. We highly recommend to choose one labeling method and apply that method to all universal waste streams and containers. As shown in the photo here, a universal waste handler can label their universal waste containers as universal waste, followed by the accompanying type of waste. So in this instance, universal waste aerosol cans. A second option is to label the universal waste containers as waste, followed by the accompanying type of waste, such as waste batteries, and your third and final option is to label the universal waste containers as used, followed by the accompanying type of waste, so used lamps. Universal waste handlers may only accumulate the, the universal waste generated or received on site for one calendar year. Listed here are various ways the universal waste handler may ensure these waste streams are only on site for one year. Handlers may use these methods or any other method, which clearly demonstrates the length of time that the universal waste has been accumulated from the date it becomes a waste or is received. These methods include marking the accumulation start date on the container itself, maintaining an inventory system, or placing the waste in a designated location where that entire location has been identified with the accumulation start date, which then applies to all containers within that area. So again, the facility gets to choose the method in which they ensure universal waste is only accumulated on site for one year. And again, we highly recommend to standardize this method for all universal waste streams and their containers. SQH must inform all their employees who handle or have responsibility for managing universal waste. The information must describe proper handling and emergency procedures appropriate to the types of universal waste handled at the facility. LQHs must ensure that all employees are thoroughly familiar with proper waste handling and emergency procedures. Relative to their responsibilities during normal facility operations and emergencies. Large quantity handlers must also maintain documentation of basic shipping papers for all of the universal waste transported on and off site. 
The record may take the form of a log, invoice, manifest, bill of lading, mo movement document, or other shipping document. The record must include the name and address of the originating universal waste handler or foreign shipper, the quantity of each type of universal waste received, and the date of receipt of the shipment. And finally, these documents must be maintained for three years. Now that we covered the universal waste management requirements, what are off-site shipments? When sending universal waste off-site, it must go to another universal waste handler, destination facility, or a foreign universal waste destination facility. It is very important to ensure the receiving handler or destination facility agrees to accept the shipments. There are specific regulations pertaining to rejected shipments of universal waste, which can be referenced in 273.18. If a handler decides to self-transport universal waste, let's say if you have three facilities that generate universal waste, but you want to accumulate all universe, universal waste at one facility so that it is easier to transport a larger amount of universal waste to a destination. The handler must ensure compliance with 273 subpart D. In regards to 273 subpart D, the facility must verify if the shipment of universal waste meets the DOT definition of hazardous materials, and if so, it must be properly described on a shipping paper in accordance with DOT. And finally, what are the universal waste destination facilities? Where does all that universal waste go? A destination facility is the facility where the universal waste is being treated, disposed of, or recycled. If your facility accepts universal waste and are recycling it, in addition to being a destination facility, you may also be classified as a recycler. If your facility is recycling universal waste, and especially storing universal waste before it's being recycled, it is crucial that the facility proves the recycling activities are legitimate and comply with ADQ's substantive policy regarding storage prior to recycling. And finally, as a destination facility, they are required to maintain a record of each shipment for three years from the date of the receipt. So to recap on the main points we discussed today, it is important to understand that waste batteries, lamps, mercury containing equipment, aerosol cans, and pesticides are the only hazardous waste that can be managed as universal waste. When you do have these types of waste streams at your facility, and let's say a battery cell gets damaged or a fluorescent lamp is broken, then an accurate hazardous waste determination is required. We talked about the very specific best management practices, as well as the management practices that are required to be in compliance with those universal waste regulations at 40 CFR 273. We discussed the required documentation for both small and large quantity handlers and destination facilities. We discussed how facilities who self-transport their universal waste need to check with compliance with DOT. And lastly, if your facility treats or recycles universal waste, that there are specific requirements that need to be met and which you can review with the ADQ substantive policy on our website or check in with ADQ to see if the facility meets any of the standards or if they are exempt from them. And lastly, you will find some links on the slide that I mentioned earlier, as well as some other potentially useful sources. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. You can email our general hazardous waste inbox for more site specific questions. In the meantime, does anyone have any general universal waste questions?